Welcome. And I cannot hear. I cannot tell if my sound is messed up here. Hello. Test. 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 Test, test. Test. I will be back. I need to ask if I can be heard because I, I can't hear. I can't hear me. So I have no idea if I'm about to go into the stream blind and I would prefer just to be, just to be sure. Any. 
fact check. Yeah, no, it doesn't look like I'm getting any sound. Okay, one sec. Hello. Testing. This, I think it's my core. It seems to be the culprit. Alas. Alright, welcome to Bayesian Cognitive Modeling. I cannot he hear you guys, but my roommate let me know that it looks like my stream is working. So I'm just going to go ahead and wing it and make sure, you know, if the sound's off today, then, you know, that's what happened. But. Once again, we got another late night stream. I was tinkering with my homework for too long and now here we are. So we're just gonna get right into it. We're doing, once again, from the exercises in Bayesian Cognitive Modeling. I'm here just going through and learning how to do Bayesian inference by doing it. So that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna keep moving on through the case studies and I think we're gonna start a new example today. That'll be great. I'm I'm going to go pretty like slow pace through it, I think, just because I want to focus on really getting something from the material as well as, you know, I don't think I'm going to, I'd like to move as quickly because I was just looking at code all day anyway. So we're just going to go at a pace that feels right today. And that look, it's looking like it's going to be slow. <laughs> Especially since I can't get my music to work too, so I'm not gonna be all flowed in, you know. It's gonna be me talking to the sound of my Mac struggling. So it says sound is coming out. In fact, it says it's coming out of. Thank you. 
So it looks like I'll just have to do output device here. Alright, so this will work. So I can do output device without using the cord and I can still get mic'd audio. Alright, I was I solved the problem. We're all good. Great, and then I'll just edit that. Sound a little loud, loud enough, and Welcome. Okay. Case studies. Today, like I mentioned briefly yesterday, we're going to be exploring extra s extra sensory perception. And this is actually one of the examples where um, in the literature that started from a study that came out in a fairly reputable journal describing the ability of <laughs> college students to have this idea of precognition. They could somehow predict or actually predict the future um, in the task. And um, this really stirred up the psychology community because they called BS on it and Wagamaker, one of the authors of this book, actually went ahead and demonstrated why it was the case that this was just merely a, a manipulation of, or this was merely random chance rather than actually being representative of them you know, getting ta getting uh, correct answers beyond what was uh, predicted by chance. So the, it was an ESP essentially is what the came of it and then when the studies were replicated um, down the road this became more clear that it didn't replicate but that's a different story today we're just going to talk about ESP <laughs> we're going to talk about op we're going to talk about mechanisms to um, prevent these sort of uh, ridiculous or unreliable findings or not. Okay, let's see. Mm-hmm, cool. One of the arguments, right, so one of the arguments against BEM by Wagamakers was that um, BEM uh, took advantage of what is, was called optimal stopping. So in frequency statistics, um, you can gather data and then stop and then gather data and then stop. And then the probability that you're going to observe an a size um, of an effect great enough to uh, be significantly different than whatever your null effect is increases because you're especially if you're not um, accounting for multiple comparisons here so it's like sampling from the a random uh, distribution over a bunch of times i'm likely to get an effect that's large right so th if you're just adding one little cook to the pot and then um, pulling out an estimate again you know you're going to get an estimate that demonstrates the significance of your findings or the the statistical significance of your findings. So we're going to analyze data from a, a replication experiment and assess the evidence for stable individual differences in uh, for the effect of inability and for the effect of extroversion. Cool. Also, we're going to use a different example. Cool. Oh, so no, extroverted women seem to be the best at. Oh, 
ex- extroverted women had the best uh, predictive accuracy in terms of precognition ability. So that's why we're looking at the abil- effect of extroversion. So we're going to talk about, first we have to overview what optimal stopping rules are, um, which is you know, perfect. So when researchers report p-values, they often don't realize that they have to specify a sampling plan. This is a big point. Um, this is um, in part the reason why, this is a big reason why we have an issue in terms of the statistical reliability of our um, estimations. Um, and why nowadays we actually ask people to specify these sort of stopping plans in advance in addition to some sort of um, effort to calculate uh, the power of their uh, test as well which ties into the uh, sampling plan in part because it, the sampling plan is should or ought to be dependent on the, the, the statistical power. So that's why I guess I'm bringing up statistical power here, but really we're just talking about uh, the stopping rule, right? Because you could have a stopping rule that wasn't um, dependent on the statistical power of your test uh, and uh, use some other kind of criteria, though th- that would wouldn't be as sensible or it would be um, you know you just have to be honest why this was the case right so if you're going to test 100 subjects you got to test 100 subjects period So here, one way in order to identify, so one w- it might be challenging to know if your, any particular study was subject to st- optional stopping rules. So was your subject study somehow, you know, just a fluke where the effect size that you observe, you know, f- uh, based on the probability distri- uh, s- distribution it was pulled from was just, um, it wasn't likely, but it, it uh, in this instance it occurred. But... Um, over time and using sort of sort certain types of meta analytic strategies we're able to get these um, distributions of how for any given study here you can see these studies the effect size might change as a function of the um, number of subjects so you can see here for effects for studies that have small effect sizes we have i mean large effect sizes uh, we have something the number of subjects was low. And that's an instance of this being um, a study that was just under um, underpowered. Well, not, not even underpowered. It's just undersampled, like not enough sample size. Um, however, you see as you get the increase the number of subjects um, you get an effect size that is not only really lower but you know they, they tend to be more clustered right so the true effect size one you can imagine is somewhere around these sorts of distributions so between like so that's an extreme might be ex- an extreme point in the other direction so the effect size could be somewhere around the average maybe like between 0 to 0 to 5 or something like that so that would be the the true effect of this particular um, whatever I was interested in. Okay, the negative relationship between them suggests that the results are contaminated. Oh, or this particular characteristics are of negative relationship here is a characteristic of optimal stopping. Uh, that's new to me. Let's see.
All right, so we're combining tools here. So we're going to look at, um, like we did way early on, how we estimated a correlation coefficient. We're going to get a posterior distribution for the correlation coefficient. And then we're going to use Bayesian model comparisons in order to assess the hypothesis that the correlation that r would be equal to zero or r would be equal to some other value. And based on what we get from the base factor there, we're going to be able to assess the relative contribution for either of those hypotheses. Um, so that's what this does. And we set a uniform distribution here for r. And then we can take a look at the results here. And you can see that the correlation coefficient is extremely negative in the posterior distribution. And here's the unif you can see evidence in favor with the, fr oh, so here, the frequencies value is then pinpointed here at negative a point eight seven, and then the maximum density point for the posterior is about, it's very similar. It's close. It's a little less. Though if we compared using hypothesis testing, the density at zero for the uniform distribution and the density at zero for the posterior distribution, looks like we have a lot of evidence in favor. So the prior is about 21 times greater than the posterior. So Bayes factor is about 21 in favor of the alternative. So there definitely, so this demonstrates that there certainly is a negative correlation between sample size and effect size here. Whereas we increase sample size, the effect size decreases. Um, there's evidence in support of that. It's pretty simple. I won't even go and run this unless the these ask me to. What does the Bayesian analysis tell you about the association between sample size and effect size? It tells me that my effect, oh, here we go. As I increase the number of subjects in my study, the effect size decreases in size. So, um, I mean, in theory, if I continued to increase my effect sample size, we would get a effect size of zero, right? I also like to just say we're like more than halfway through the book. I just thought about that. So go us. We've really been making our making our way downtown here. You know what I'm saying? Oh, so it's asking particularly what about the Bayesian analysis, not just the what is <laughs> how to interpret a correlation. So in this case. Uh, like it says in the sentence above, base factor is 20, about 21 in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So what that means is that the data are about 21 times more likely under the alternative hypothesis than they are the null. So with that being said, that means that it's likely that there is a correlation between um, sample size and effect size rather than there isn't. So we've just uh, presented strong evidence in favor of there being an association between the the two variables here um, and thus also discredited the idea that there wasn't a correlation between the two hypotheses because in the Bayesian framework we can um, provide evidence in favor of one hypothesis rel relative to another um, all right section 5.2 considered extending the correlation model 
could that be applied here? In this case, it's a little bit different, I think, because before we were, before the two variables of interest had this, uh, also had measurement error with them. I'm not sure if I have measurement error um, in terms of my ability to count people, right? It's like I could have measurement error in calculating height, right? My rulers and stuff could be off, but I guess I could ha introduce measurement error for counting subjects where, you know, my RA is tired or my PhD student is really, really tired and um, <laughs> they're not good at typing in the numbers. Oh, well, let's say our undergrad RA, I hope my PhD student isn't we're all coding the counts on the subjects, please. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and the effect size is then I guess you could have a distribution for the f effect sizes so some uncertainty surrounding those measurements um, like posterior, a posterior distribution for each of the or a probability distribution for the effect sizes rather than being um, individual points but though then again it's just i think the difference here and what it want this question wants us to just think about is that the variables um, you have to think about what the variables mean if you're going to attempt to incorporate some uh, measure of uncertainty and then ask yourself like, what does that incorporation of uncertainty um, accounting for that in the model what does that buy you right and in this case i don't think it buys me um, anything to introduce an additional uncertainty into the measurements for both effect sizes and sample size unless i want to do i don't know test the robustness uh so like a sensitivity analysis of some sorts where I introduce uncertainty into the measurements of the effect sizes um, in order to I think that helps the the opposing hypothesis but overall the the idea here would be like somehow um, the case for incorporating uncertainty into this particular model would be so that such that I would be attempting to bolster the um, null hypothesis and thus um, in demonstrating a, a model comparison I would be even more um, certain about the evidence in favor of the association right I'll go that so a classical p-value test uh, next question the classical p-value test in the Pearson's correlation gives us that value with that confidence interval what conclusions do you draw, would you draw from this analysis and how would you compare those conclusions from the Bayesian analysis well we have a, a strong or association between the um, two variables and that if we were over the long run if we were to uh, sample r again um, it is we can be 95 percent confident that the parameter um, over a bunch of samples um, would be in a interval would be um, in this interval so it's not that this particular parameter estimate is in the interval, but over time, 95% um, of the intervals that we generated would contain the true parameter value. Um, 
really all I'm tooling from confidence intervals is that you know, there's not zero here, right? So oh, it would be less 5% ch chance that a parameter over the long term that we would draw would be from, it would represent a not, uh, not a significant effect. Um, with respect to a null hypothesis that um, said that the effect was zero. So given that that is effect is zero, given that there's no, the null hypothesis is that the correlation is equal to zero, um, we observed an effect size um, that is large enough that it, um, it's not likely it's due to uh, chance. So we, um, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, that the um, effect that we observed or effect larger than this um, would be chance. So it's very, very unlikely that this is a due to chance. Okay, we do not need to compute the savage Dickey ra density ratio on the original scale. For example, there are good arguments to first transform the posterior samples from using uh, z-scores. Using this, what? Uh, try using this transformation. What difference do you observe? Okay. So now we got to pull up the code. I set my working directory. And now. Optimal stopping jag, optimal stopping text. All right, here's the correlation coefficient. This in the point estimates for the density. We can take a look at the. Um, I think we. Yeah. R. Here's the distribution for R. 80. Credible interval. All right, so what does it want? Z is arctan R. RC I'm gonna look up Arctan and Jags really quick. Cause I haven't used this before. Arc tangent. Hmm. 
First, the transform the posterior distributions. Oh, is this an R code maybe? Let's make sure. All right, so what I tried to do is just incorporate a term that would reprint parameterize R so that it was equal to Z, where Z is just equal to arctan R. need to initialize r z because well i don't generate samples for z but just like here i generate lambdas but i still look for sigmas Let's see what the answer for the jag is. Uh, 
So it looks like instead of incorporating it into the likelihood or incorporating it so it calculates it at each s sample, I just do it in the I do it in the R script. Oh, that wasn't enough. So if we took the Z score, I'm curious why they did this. I wonder what happens if I do this. If it's the same thing. Posterior. Density for the posterior and then fit for the prior. Density for the prior. Oh, they create a distribution for the prior. Then they fit the density to it. And then they extract the density at the value. And they do the base factor. So if we do it like this, we're still going to get the same answer where the prior distribution here that was generated, this is density here, the prior distribution here using Z scores, I believe. So 
So now we get distributions that are normally distributed. Now we just estimate the prior distribution. All right. Yep. To you. All right. So here it's just the estimates of the density for the normally distributed now. This is the Z transformed correlation coefficient. So. That's not really it. We'd still get the same results, but less of it. Less so, right? Let's be F. Let's be exacting. So the Bayes factor, it's just now about 19 times more likely that the when we observe the data that uh, there's evidence in favor of there being an association between sample size and effect size. transform Here is an, a corrected distribution. Restricted range, Z score.
the two theoretical distributions. Okay. So the difference here does not change the practical conclusions. We still find evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis, that being there being a relationship between the two variables. we're doing let's see we're just about at an hour now so no let's talk about it so Wagenmacher's paper was a replication study of BEMS experiment but differed in a slightly couple ways so he wanted to maximize the probability of observing an effect they tested only women and included only neutral and erotic pictures so if the effect that BEM observed was largest for women in the uh, um, conditions that show the erotic photos then there they should just get a very extremely large effect if they only tested those sub populations at sufficiently um, large enough samples So we go performance, session one and session two, it's this blob it looks like. So some subjects who got 30 right in one, 30 right in another, right? So 50 right in one, 20 right in the other, and then you could have gotten 50 right in the second after 20 right in the first. So a re positive relationship here would be indicating that increases in score in the first section are associated with higher scores in the second section. But that's not necessarily what we see. It's more of just a cloud right now. So we'll leave it at that. Another uh, difference is that they had two sessions, right? So ESP then, right? So the nice part about this design is that if precognition did exist and it was supposed to be large in this population, then we'd expect to see a large effect uh, of precognition if we tested subjects twice. So we tested 100 subjects on 60 trials total. But there's no systematic relationship between the two, right? So this cloud of points I was describing where I was trying to find a relationship, but there doesn't happen to be one in this case. So just as before, it makes sense to try to do inference with the correlation co coefficient and testing the alternative. So, but this time we're looking at a, 
a correlation where we expect to be positive, so we're going to have an order-restricted hypothesis test here um, where we're going to only be looking in one direction. But we're going to set the prior distribution to be uninformative and then And in this case, there's also, uh, we have a better idea of how to model behavioral uncertainty for these sorts of variables. So thus, if the ith person has k correct answers in the first session, this is a baseline. This is a performance relating to their underlying probability of getting responses correct. So it might be the case that some folks on average just get more responses. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. It might be the case that some folks on average get more responses correct, and we can account for that um, variability in performance by modeling the success rate as a Bernoulli distribution or binomial, sorry. Also, and now I have food. It's amazing. Thanks, Sarah. Cheese quesadilla. Now we can take a look at the graphical model. But now we're going to have this probability of success rate for each subject, which is derived from hmm, slap a probit distribution on it. No, I was trying to chew away from my mic. <laughs> okay. So, here then, we have n trials for each subject, which I think is consistent across the group. Be I mean, that's why it's out of the plate. 60 trials. 60 trials, and then we have the success rates for each of the subjects. Um, and from that success rate, we can model, or the number of successes per subject, um, and, and from that success rate, we can model the probability of being successful in a given trial uh, per subject, and then we can use that estimate to derive means for the first and second um, blocks of the experiment, which we can use a multivariate Gaussian distribution to model. Excellent. Then we set um, uninformative prior distributions for all of the probability of these values. And we're just looking at the association between past performance and future performance. Mm 
Every time I look at this, it always looks like magic. Especially because I don't. S well, yeah, I guess R is here, right? But. I just think about how we're not traditionally calculating effect size here. Um, or at least we're not expressing a derivation of effect size um, in order to estimate it here. We're using this to get it. And we have sigma squares and then sigma times variance. Or sigma sigma. R. So here then, the if we run this, let's, let's just go and get it. Let's see. Ability, pretty simple. Standard here. What we got? What we got here? Uh, proportion of correct from block one and block two, and then here is block two. 100 trials in each block then we just create a matrix of these values where we have the first variable second variable all of the so we're going to look at the correlation between these two values across 100 subjects Doop. and then initiate and we'll run it Once we have the posterior distribution here, we're gonna extract from the output all of the samples which are, are greater than zero. So rather than doing some restriction, we're literally just gonna pull the samples from the posterior distribution that are positive. And then from that, we're gonna set a, a bound here from zero to one because it has to be positive. We're going to take only the positive values and we're going to calculate the density at e these values. And then we're going to calculate the posterior density at zero. And the prior is uniform, so it's going to be one. And then we can look at the base factor here. And there seems to be evidence in favor of the prior distribution this time. right? How do I check? Well, naturally, I always do this where I just flip it because it's easier for me to look at. S so slight evidence in favor of the prior distribution here. So evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. Mm, I'm interested to see what the average for the R dot pause is. Low correlation. If you looked at the confidence intervals too, did they, they did not contain, they contained a very, very low value. So it was 0 0.01 in the um, credible interval, interval. So it makes sense why we don't have super strong evidence in favor of the null hypothesis because there's a, s very ex there's a chance that there's extremely, extremely, extremely small effect, though an effect nonetheless. We can also, it looks like, here's the second method. So we can calculate 
the density or estimate the density again here, but without doing the bounding. And then we get the zero and now we get the area. So the sum of the posterior greater than one. Okay. So we take the sum of the posterior of one, which is one over the length is one. So the area is one. <laughs> posterior odd ratio. So we get the posterior over the one then. And then we take the prior over the posterior over one. Which is once again stronger evidence in favor of the prior, though still not that much evidence. And then we can use Jeffrey's numerical integration method. So here, a function that takes rho, and we're going to take 1 minus rho squared to the power of n over 2 over all over 1 minus rho times r to the power of n over n minus 0.5. We integrate this. So we're going to take the integral of this, set the limits, and we're going to get the value. And we'll return as the base factor. So this is a way to calculate the exact value of the base factor. And we get something fairly similar to our first value here by just doing the posterior cut. And then last, we can plot. Here with the correlation being close to zero, here's the whole prior hypothesis of density at zero, and here's the posterior. So, more evidence in favor, slightly in favor of the prior. The density, of the posterior is about two times greater than that of the prior at this point. So the base factor is about two times in favor of the null hypothesis that the correlation is zero, right? This is evidence level that Jeffrey would call not worth more than a bare mention. So, eh. not really big evidence in favor of one model or the other here is what that says, though. Uh, the value would be something you take to the bank. It's pretty inconclusive. We have very low probability the, of the posterior. Though there's not necessarily evidence in favor of the prior either. Alter the null hypothesis. Uniform prior from negative one to one. The base factor in this case would definitely be zero. Be symmetric to zero. Because, like, look, most of the values lie really close to zero here.
So if we were to like add more, let's extend this to a, a two-way test, we're just going to get additional evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. So the base factor um, in would get larger if we were to um, if we were to do the hypothesis test uh, two s two way style as shown here. rather than see more evidence or less evidence Last question. A classical analysis yields ooh, a positive correlation, but we have a confidence interval that hmm, non-significant p-value, however, fails to indicate whether the data are ambiguous or whether the evidence is in favor of the null. How does the base factor resolve this ambiguity? Um, uh, it provides us evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. Um, just about two times in favor, almost. So it helps resolve this uh, ambiguity by providing us some comparison of hypotheses with respect to a null uh, association and um, the one-way association that we observed. So under a fairly rigorous test of one way, um, I'm looking at zero, rigorous for psychology, but two times evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. All right, so we'll stop there and we're gonna move to, next time we're gonna incorporate information about the extroversion. I think we're also going to estimate extroversion as a covariate cool so we're also going to get information about uh, extroversion in addition to performance on the task it looks like and we're going to incorporate all of that into the model so we'll start there tomorrow and i, I look forward to um, keep pushing along here um, and going through these examples um thanks for sticking around tonight and i'll see you tomorrow have a good night